This is a special Point of the Spear presentation, George Washington at War. Today's guest has portrayed General George Washington at national reenactments and in numerous television and theatrical productions. Living historian and author John Koopman III is here, and I'll speak with him next. I'm Robert Child, and this is Point of the Spear. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but he felt sort of an embarrassment that he didn't have a formal education. Is that correct? Yes. What had happened was all of his older brothers had gone to this Appleby school in England. I believe it's in southern England. And he would have been slated to go there to get his, his higher education. But his father died when he was 11. So that was close to him. So, yes, all through his life, he felt a shortcoming, uh, although he was... Well read. We we know that uh, interesting. A book was written about the books of his library, and they can tell that the books were they weren't just show. He had actually read the books, and they know this because he was he couldn't help himself to edit. He would he would find mistakes <laughs> in the book, and he would correct it. So they whenever they find those corrections, they know okay. Like for instance, we we know you read Gulliver, Gulliver's Travels because there's all these little notes in the book that he found a mistake or something. So he was extremely well, well read. So he felt he had to make up for this lack of education in reading. But what's other, also very exciting about him is that when you look at letters that he wrote, you could be confident that was how he talked because uh, Jefferson observed him writing and he says he writes very quickly. So that means that it's kind of like a stream of consciousness. I see. So yeah. when we read his letters, we can be confident that you know, he did have a tremendous vocabulary and, and I think, but he still, he had in the war, he had what I call these, these pen men. They would be these aides to camp that had the higher education and he would have them check his letters, kind of like a spell check, grammar check kind of a thing. Like Hamilton. Right. And then Hamilton, he got to the point where he knew Washington so well, he could just write the letter. He could just write it as if, <laughs> as if Washington <laughs> wrote it himself. In his own but, voice, I'm sure. Yeah, pretty much. So, uh, yeah. but yes, he was always conscious of the fact of his shortcoming of not having the higher education, but he was extremely well read. And um, he obviously had, you know, other tremendous capabilities. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's bring it up to the revolution. And the question I wanted to um, ask about that, that you could uh, illuminate us, is there were many plots against him. He was not supported by his fellow commanders. On the contrary, they plotted against him, and he called them a cabal. Could you speak about this? Yes, there was the Conway cabal. And uh, what had happened was you had, uh, of course, the, the, the siege of Boston, you know, went well in the sense that the, the British had to vacate. But then pretty much after that, everything went very badly. So you had the, the terrible the Battle of Long Island and the retreat through Manhattan and then the retreat from the, from the Jerseys. And even though uh, Trenton and Princeton basically saved the war, and those are probably considered Washington's two most important battles, there were still people that even though he showed you know, his, his nature there and what he could do, there were still those that felt that they could do better. So General Gates was in charge when he had the Battle of Saratoga. That was really Benedict Arnold, uh, strangely, <laughs> yeah. who, really won, who really won that battle because Gates wanted to just basically stay behind his defensive lines where Arnold wanted to be um, offensive, which was his nature. But then Gates got all the credit, which is one of the things that troubled Arnold. But then Gates started rising in prominence. And so there were those, well, it's natural. He has that experience as a British officer. Ironically, he was at the Battle of Monongahela. It's funny, the Battle of Monongahela is like a who's who of, you know, <laughs> people to see. I've seen the list. People should look it up on the internet. It's amazing how many future famous people were there at that battle. There were the junior varsity at the time. That's right. <laughs> so... So there was this Conway cabal, and they, there was this effort to, to replace him. Now, it's amazing. At Valley Forge, it was a crucible in many ways. So Washington, he, he's, trying, he's there because he's trying to keep an eye on the British in Philadelphia. So he's fighting the British. 
He's fighting starvation. His men are in rags. He's trying to get clothing. And then there's this Conway cabal going on. So he has he has to fight like you know three enemies, in addition to all the illness and the sickness. But this is where he had served in the House of Burgesses, and this political experience came to his aid. And then there were his supporters, and they alarmed him, uh, alerted him to the this conspiracy going on, and very deftly using his political experience. I wish I could quote it, but he, one of his uh, former aides. Uh, this is Joseph Reed. He wrote a very negative letter back and forth to Gates. And Washington said, oh, uh, Mr. Reed, I'm so sorry, but in opening the correspondence, I saw this letter that you, you sent to General Gates. I couldn't help but read it. So it was, it was, very, it was very clever how he, <laughs> he let it be known that oh, I, know what's going, I know what's going on. But uh, so once that was passed, uh, it did not uh go well because the battle of camden later in the war it was actually called the camden races it was amazing how fast uh general gates got on a horse and retreated from that battle and he huh. never recovered from that disgrace in south carolina yes in south carolina camden south carolina yeah so gates he faded away and then at a certain at that point in the war is just decided that you know washington is the man and I just wanted to say too that um, in the end, at the end, I wanted to read a couple of things from Lengel's book about Washington. If we have time, sure. But yeah. he he was a battlefield commander. In other words, he wasn't back at some remote uh, command tent when there was when he was in, in charge of a battle. He was out there. As a matter of fact, some of the letters of the soldiers at the time they got mad at him. They they wrote these letters that. Oh, the General Washington he exposes himself to too much danger. And there's, especially at the Battle of Princeton, there was one point where he was right between the two firing lines. And one of his aides actually covered his face. He couldn't watch. The British let loose the valley. And there he was on a white horse, <laughs> standing there in the middle, and not, not a single bullet hit him. So That's crazy. He, he could never, uh, he could never be challenged for his bravery in, uh, in battle. Let's take a uh, look at his post-war years um, after the revolution and um, um, mention the Whiskey Rebellion that occurred as well. So yes, he um, obviously there was he was concerned about the direction of the country that it was going. That it was called the Articles of Confederation. It was a very weak form of government, and then of course through his leadership, he ended up being president of the Constitutional uh, Convention. He had the Constitution. And everybody knew when they saw him president of the Constitu Constitutional Convention that they we're looking at our first president right here. And of course, by unanimous, unanimous uh, vote through the uh, through the, the college there, he uh, he be, you know, became the first president. So one of their first concerns was the war debt. And of course, you know we have our national debt now. They had their national debt; they were trying to pay off. So Hamilton, uh, being of you know, the Treasury, had the idea of the uh, the whiskey. Uh, tax to you know the tax on on spirits to try to raise revenue to pay down the debt and now in western pennsylvania was a very rough place the pittsburgh area you had had all sorts of uh i call it like the wild west of our country of that time oh i see yeah sure. some pretty hardcore rough and ready people out there would have a lot of revolution war veterans and so when this tax came through, he said, I'm not going to pay that tax. You know, they, they, they saw, you know, you're over there. At the time, the capital was in Philadelphia. You know, you're so far away, you know, but they, they, were, they were doing a smart thing. I get them credit that, you know, crops go bad. But if you make whiskey, it, it just gets better, right? It doesn't, uh, it doesn't go bad. So they were, there was a lack of currency, of hard currency. So they were using it for bartering, for actually, for, you know, exchanging mm -hmm. the lack of currency. So they sent out tax collectors and other officials, and some were tarred and feathered. And there was there was one a representative. His house was burned down, and they had seven thousand in a local militia there. Seven thousand. Now these would have been made up of obviously Revolutionary War veterans, or at least at least a good part of it. But these were men that really knew how to use a musket. Yeah, and knew how to stand up in in battle. So what was Washington going to do? So we felt that it had to be uh, enforced. It was uh, it was voted on by Congress to raise this tax. 
So but the only time in our country's history you had a Washington, you had a president leading men into battle. So he, he did two things simultaneously. He sent out um, representatives to negotiate, but then he also raised an army of 13,000, so almost twice the size of what the, the militia in, the, in, in uh, the Pittsburgh area. And then, of course, they're marching out, and then a word gets back that they're marching out. And one of the things we forget today, we look at the dollar bill, we look at these paintings, we see these senior statesmen, we it's oh, yeah, that's interesting, Washington. But we got to remember, at that time, people thought very differently about him, that he was uh, res admired, respected, even loved, but he was also feared. Hmm. They knew, based on what he did in the revolution, that when he started something, he was going to finish it. So that when word got to the conspirators that George Washington is coming at the head of an army to crush the rebellion, they said going around, yeah, these taxes, they're not so bad. They'd be, they'd be, they'd be <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> so he's smart. Did, so the so the so the army did come and Washington didn't actually he he figured that he learned that they were backing down. And so he didn't actually enter uh, Pittsburgh, but the army did go in and the conspirators were rounded up. And very interestingly, they were sentenced to death, but Washington, he pardoned them. He, that was one of his first uh, pardons. He, yeah. But so in other words, oh. it was very uh, effective, but it was a real test of our, of our early country. You know, you know nobody, obviously nobody likes taxes, but do we have the right to impose taxes? And Washington felt that it was legal and it, and it, uh, and it should be enforced, but... But it was a uh, an interesting part of our history that doesn't get you know a lot of attention because it was a fairly brief uh, campaign. But nonetheless, yeah. it, it it showed a part of Washington that uh, the respect that people had for him. One thing about that convention, um, also that I remember from my reading, is um, when it was obvious that Washington was the perfect choice to become president um he had sort of planted the seed there by attending the uh, convention in uniform isn't that true so that yes yeah, so the uh in 1774 and 75 yeah i was actually in 1775 right before lexington and concord he did come in his, now there's some contention some people think he came in his french and indian war uniform I believe the correct would be the uniform that became his Revolutionary War uniform, which was the Fairfax County. He was the colonel in the Fairfax County militia and always being the, the fashion plate. He was always conscious of the latest fashion. So he would have come in the fashion of that time, which is the uniform uh, you see you know, throughout the revolution. Mm -hmm. but yes, he was a strange time. It wasn't like, okay, I want to be commander in chief. You, people didn't talk like that. You sort of kind of made it known that yeah, if you ask me, I think I might, I might do it. And yeah, you know, yeah, so he was, yeah. So he was kind of, kind of advertising the fact that he had military experience. And uh, of course, the, the the joke was that every committee he was on, he was the head of the committee because he was the tallest man in the room. He was. Uh, there's different disputes of his of his height. I believe he was six foot four, because when they laid him off for his casket, he, he was measured at uh, six foot three and a half. But of course, you shrink when you get older. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, when you're when you're laying prone, you do expand a bit. So I think it's um, it's easy that to estimate that he was six foot four. I happen to base by some strange quirk of genetics on the exact same dimensions because they the man that made the clothing for the Mount Vernon display made my clothing. And he had access to Washington's dimensions, and it's the same. Amazing. Amazing. So, uh, interesting uh, coincidence there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, to close. How would you uh, sum up the man, his essential qualities that we can, uh, th that are timeless? Yeah, I would like to uh, read some, a couple experts uh, by a uh, book by Edward Langle. Once again, I recommend him as a good resource. Now, this is at the close of his book. So it's George Washington, The Military Life, and he's summing up uh, Washington. On occasion, Washington's regard for his officer's judgment got him into trouble. Before battles or during periods of maneuver, he liked to convene his council of war. 
This led to some people calling him indecisive, but there was an antidote for, to his indecision on hearing gunfire and experiencing the adrenaline surge that came with it. Washington typically ceased equivocating and acted with a plum. Poise in battle was one of his most obvious merits. Now, this particular comment, um, I had uh, a discussion with another historian by the name of uh, John Rees, and we, it was actually his idea. I think it was the fox hunting. He was an avid fox hunter. Mm. If you think of the fox hunt, it's like a military operation. You're you're chasing the fox with a, using like a combined arms with the uh, the dogs, the hounds chasing, and then you're on horseback. It's a it's a fast moving event. There's even communication with the fox hunting horn. And I think this ease and this he was totally at home in the saddle. And I think being mounted on horseback and also this natural sense about him that he uh, he just had no fear in battle. So that was one of his strategic uh, or tactical, I should say, uh, most important aspects was once he, once he smelled the gunpowder, he, it was like something snapped in his head. This regiment was over here, tenth regiment over there. He, he just he, he came to his to his uh, forefront. A natural. Now this could be Washington's epitaph. I think it's very fair. I have to say what Lengel wrote. This is another quote from Lengel's book. Washington was imperfect. <laughs> In strictly military terms, he does not merit the comparisons that have sometimes been made between him and the generals like Marlborough, Frederick the Great, Napoleon, or Robert E. Lee. Yet he remains a remarkable man, one of those Tolstoyan figures whose acts determine the course of history. James Thomas Flexner has called him the indispensable man. Nobody, not Nathaniel Green or Henry Knox, and certainly not Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin and John Adams, united the military, political, and personal skills that made Washington unique. I think that pretty much sums them up. Absolutely. But your book, so people can go out and get it, is called George Washington at War, 1776. John, thank you so much for coming on the show today and Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you, sir. Well, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year to you, Rob. That's it for this episode. Thanks so much for joining me. Coming up on Christmas Eve, be here for Christmas 1942, featuring author Peter Harmson discussing his book, Dark Christmas. One of the uh, interesting things about war is that it gives us a much deeper knowledge about what it really means to be human. It like brings both the proverbially best and the worst in, in, in people. This is uh, even more the case when we are talking about Christmas and wartime. We'll also have radio excerpts and music of the time to recreate Christmas 1942. It's all Christmas Eve on Point of the Spear. And if you like what you hear, leave a rating, a review, or just click the follow button. You can find me on Twitter at Rob Child. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spirit. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.